Hello, everyone. As uh, people are arriving, we're just going to provide our um, city clerk an opportunity to transition. We had a previous neighborhood services and education committee and they needed an opportunity just to uh, uh, transition over to this meeting. So we will begin in approximately two minutes. We have Spanish interpretation and that's part of the, the holdup um, that we just need to integrate those services into this meeting. Thank you. You know, my daughter got married this weekend, Maya. So outdoors, and we're dealing with who's testing positive now. Oh no! Well, congratulations. Thank I mean, you. on the first part, I hope every everything's <laughs> negative, and it works out. I'm hoping. Most, most of my kids are vaccinated, so thank goodness. Good, good. It's good to see you. Hi, Cindy. 
Hey, Miss Maya. Cindy, is that a great big ball or an umbrella behind you? Yeah, you know it's fun. <laughs> I have I have two umbrellas, both from Pride. Awesome. Uh, Hi, Susan. And I'm trying to figure out what's behind hey, Sylvia. Everyone. It looks like a jewelry case. Oh, doesn't it? But it, it is the vice president's um, office from that show Veep. <laughs> <laughs> it was predicting that we were going to have a, a female um, vice president soon enough. So That's I thought it was terrific. <laughs> Sylvia has the best backgrounds, definitely. <laughs> I, I have a Golden Girls. Um, Steinfeld, you name it, I got it. So we're giving an opportunity for our city clerk to transition um, into this meeting. We just finished our neighborhood services um, and education committee uh, a couple of minutes ago, and uh, they requested just a couple of minutes to um, set up the tr uh, translation services. So I'm just going to check in with them and see if they're on line um, and if they are ready to roll. Yes, this is Tony. We're good to go. Um, I'm sorry, but um, I'm not assigned as interpreter yet, Tony. I did. I did assign you, and I don't know why it's not. I will do it oh, again. I'm so sorry. Oh, there Assign you go. Your... Thank you. I'm okay. good. Thank you. Now we're good to go. Okay, wonderful. So I call to order our joint meeting. Um, with our county colleagues, um, the Neighborhood Services and Education Committee and Committee of the Whole, um, joint special edition, if you will. Um, and before we begin, I wanted to announce that we have translation services, as you just heard. Um, our city clerk uh, will share how those can be accessed uh, for today's meeting. So if Tony, you can let us know or play a video. Hola y bienvenidos a esta reunión. Para acceder a la función de interpretación, haga clic en el icono de globo en la parte inferior de la ventana de Zoom y selecciona el idioma que desea. Para escuchar claramente el audio de interpretación, le recomendamos que también seleccione la opción para silenciar el audio original, que es la opción más baja en el menú después de hacer clic en el icono del globo. I would also like, this is Tony Tabor, City Clerk. I would also like to add, if we are interpreting for public speakers, if you are on the panel and want to hear the translation of the public speakers, you'll need to go down to that interpretation icon at the bottom and select the English language channel because they'll be interpreting the language onto the English channel. Right now it's defaulted to off. And so you'll only hear like the main channel. So to hear the public speakers, if you're a panelist, you need to select the English channel. Wonderful, thank you, Tony. So I will do another welcome. People should feel very welcomed. I think this is my third try at welcoming folks to uh, City of San Jose's Neighborhood Services and Education Committee and Committee of the Whole, with, along with uh, Santa Clara County, children, seniors, and family committee on the topic of child well-being. Um, and we will begin with roll call on our city sites. I'll ask the clerk for that uh, city of San Jose roll call. Jimenez? Present. Cohen? Here. Esparza? Here. Carrasco? Present. Arenas? Here. We have a quorum. Wonderful. So now I am going to turn it over to Supervisor Chavez for the uh, co county clerk uh, to call roll call. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I too am very excited to be here today. And I'm going to ask uh, Dave if he can call the roll for our committee. Good afternoon. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg. I'm here. And Chairperson Chavez. Here. Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, today, uh, we said it, it was this topic was going to be around child care, um, but I think we should, I, I'd like to frame it as care for our children in our community. Um, as you all know, uh, 
childcare was often inaccessible to many of our families, even before this pandemic, and it's just uh, aggravated the situation. Um, we all know that families continue to struggle um, to address this, this disruption of their own childcare um, caused by the pandemic. And when we take a look at the varied responses and um, disruptions for, for care for children, it really varies among demographics. And so when we take a look at those folks who are earning less than 40,000 um, income, especially here in California, it really um, can take you only so far, especially if you live in this Bay Area. 69% of those said that someone in their household lost their job or had reduced hours or lost wages. And so a majority of those being women and in, in contrast, there was only 5% um, of top uh, income categories that were um, able to shift and work from home. Um, and create, but, and this also created an imbalance of work and home life for uh, children and parents. And, um, and dare I say, um, a lot of the times that has been women um, and some research has identified as women being those folks who are most impacted. Uh, and so I'm really grateful that we're all here and that we continue uh, to address the local care for children uh, needs of our community and those that care for them. And so we have this great opportunity uh, to support a predominantly female dominated field, which is our child care providers. They're um, the folks who really um, earn uh, a lot less, but really should be rewarded with the most. Um, and I have to point out that the last time that we had a, a very significant um, child care investment was when um, back in World War II when uh, men left for the war and women took up some of the work that the men were had left behind. Um, and so there was childcare for all. It hasn't happened again. I mean, there's been quite a number of attempts to provide childcare for all, but it hasn't happened. And now with this tragic pandemic, it's created an opportunity for us to, as a city and as a county and County Office of Ed and all of those nonprofits that are in this ecosystem uh, in caring for our children, um, whether it's indirectly or directly, this is an opportunity for us to begin to discuss or continue to discuss how our systems coordinate with one another and how do we maximize our resources and move towards a regionally coordinated system of care that is centered around families. And I know that you must um, all have that in mind as well in your own respective agencies. And so welcome and, and thank you for, for allowing me to, be, uh, to express um, this this vision and this uh, mission that I'd love to that I that I just share with all of you and thank you to to all of our presenters today. Um, in addition to those who will be presenting, I wanted to make sure uh, just to take an opportunity um, to introduce some of the members of our virtual dais. Um, we've asked to participate and they have joined us today because we want their input and we want their feedback. Um, they won't necessarily be presenting. And that's Dr. Elidia Bauer, our superintendent of Alam Rock School District. And Dana Bunnett, director of Kids in Common is here with us. Um, and later on, we'll be joined by Dr. Marlene Sturm with the Children's Advocacy Center and Rocio Abundis with the Child Abuse Prevention Council. And so I will now turn it over to Supervisor Chavez. Well, thank you. This is uh, very exciting. I know this is our one of our favorite topics, and I know we have these fearless women who've been leading the way, and I'm speaking to all of you and also to my colleagues. Um, so the way we're going to break this meeting up is that we're going to break it um, into two chunks. The first is we're, uh, we're going to um, receive reports relating to federal, state, and local funding opportunities to support child care, early learning, and other services for children. And then the second um, batch of work we're going to be doing is really taking a deep dive into um, an, really an updated snapshot of what's happening here in our county with the idea that we're going to learn what the gaps are, where we're going to need to make uh, future investments, and where there are opportunities to do so. So um, 
So to get us started, um, I'm just going to remind all of uh, our presenters, they've all been given a time. And the reason I'm just, I'm kind of the bad cop, Sylvia is the good cop here. But the, the reason for that is that we really wanted to create an opportunity for a robust discussion. So um, I'm going to ask folks to, if they wouldn't mind just really doing their best to stay within that time. So to dive in, our first presenter is Dr. Marianne Duan, our County Superintendent of Schools. And uh, Dr. Duan, I'm so excited you're here to get us started. Um, we had a risk of losing her to jury duty today, uh, but she made it. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, um, Supervisor Chavez and Council Member Arenas and, and everyone for having me today. Um, I wanted to just do a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, we do have a slide deck. Is someone pulling that up for us? Great, I see it coming. Um, while this is coming up, I also just want to acknowledge that some members of the County Board of Education uh, may be in the audience today, and I also want to thank them uh, for their service and their support. Um, so my slide um, starts with the state of early learning and child care. And, you know, our early learning health and child care programs, advocacy platform and technical assistance are manifestations of our core principles of equity, diversity, inclusion, and partnership. Early learning, childcare, and expanded learning are key to ensure our children thrive, preventing the gaps before they happen and supporting the whole child and the whole family. Outcomes are significantly better for children who are able to participate in quality early care and education and before, after, and summer school programs. Next slide. The declines in birth rates partially explain the subsequent declines that we've seen in enrollment in our K-12 schools. However, even with the declines in birth rates, Santa Clara County still does not have enough subsidized quality early learning care and education and childcare spaces for all of the children who need it and are eligible. The, these declines should give us pause. It should cause us to take time to recognize how important each and every child is to our, our future and make an investment in them. We can't afford to do anything less than that. Next, we've seen declines in both space and capacity and in enrollment in our schools and programs. And not all of this can be explained by the decline in birth rate. The significant decrease in childcare capacity and TK and kindergarten enrollment is concerning. Significant declines can be somewhat associated with COVID-19. For example, some centers that closed due to less capacity, uh, safety concerns and parent uh, health and safety observations. Most offerings were virtual during COVID and many families opted out of virtual offerings because they required caregiver participation and parents exited the workforce and no longer required or could afford childcare. And also the reimbursement rates, facility needs and workforce needs that have gone largely unaddressed for many years made it difficult for providers to remain open or take advantage of new allocations for funding. The outcomes are lost social emotional learning opportunities with possible long-term impact on academic outcomes. Data indicates that low-income families were less likely to access virtual learning options during the pandemic and the inability to intervene early for our children and families uh, due to the lack of in-person availability could mean that delays um, will be present into the future. To sustain Santa Clara County as a place where children and families can live and thrive, a comprehensive coordinated system of early care, health and education is needed. That system is within our reach. Due to the leadership and persistence of many, including many of you here with me today in this meeting, it will require the investment and partnership at the local community level, cities, county, state, and federal level. We must resist the urge to create parallel systems and programs that are impossible for families to navigate and that lead to too many transitions and lack of continuity for our most vulnerable youth and their families. The state has stepped up in some meaningful ways in this last budget year. Next. The recent state budget included planned investments, most of which have not yet been 
rolled out yet for schools and providers. These investments address each core aspect of a comprehensive coordinated local system and they set the stage for significant expansion in our county. Next. Planned investments cover six major components of a comprehensive system of early care and education. Most of these budget items will be available to schools and to licensed providers. These include planning for TK expansion in particular, more funded spaces and slots for childcare and preschool, small amounts of funding for facilities to incentivize partnerships, much needed and long overdue increases in rates and reimbursements that should set the stage for stabilizing existing programs and allow for readiness to expand with new slots and spaces, considerations for full day, full year care and workforce funds for training and recruiting qualified staff. Next. This next slide shows that these buckets the items in blue are investments that all schools and providers will be able to receive. The items in purple are competitive grants the County Office of Education and school districts would need to apply for in order to receive. And those two competitive areas are facilities and staff recruitment. Next. I also want to take a moment to celebrate some of the uh, federal investments and some potential opportunities that could be before us. Um, first, the, the federal government has made announcements and some commitments to universal meals. We also expect that there will be some increased investment in er early learning or childcare, but we already know that that will not be universal preschool. And the Santa Clara area median income um, cap at 82,850 for a family of four represents a $50,000 increase over the current income threshold for the Head Start income eligibility. So that's a significant um, boost for our county. Next slide. So what does this all mean for Santa Clara County? Um, it means, for example, that we will have about, we will be eligible for about 350 more full day preschool slots. 8,000 new vouchers for childcare, and up to 10,000 new transitional kindergarten slots will become available. And with Santa Clara's new rate reimbursement, licensed state preschool and childcare centers will see about a 20 to 30% increase in funding. Licensed family childcare homes will receive about 10% increase, and our after school uh, programs will get a boost in their per student day rate so their new rate will be approximately $10.18 per student per day. Uh, that will also be a benefit. Next slide. Uh, many have been asking about the impact of transitional kindergarten expansion. This is an incredibly exciting opportunity for the state of California. Uh, what this means is that um, all four-year-olds uh, within the next few years will be eligible to attend transitional kindergarten a publicly funded program. All state subsidized early learning program that will be accessible regardless of income, so true, truly universal. And the gradual expansion plan will allow county offices of education, school districts, communities, and families to plan for this expansion in ways that will ensure the quality of the programs for families. And all four-year-olds will be eligible by the 2025-2026 school year. This will have a ripple effect on other childcare and preschool programs. I think the main benefit of this ripple effect will be the ability of these programs to serve younger children and to utilize existing public funds to ensure greater access for our zero to four year olds. It will allow for partnerships with school districts, for example, to also provide wraparound care and it will create a workforce pipeline uh, for recruitment into childcare as well as TK and kindergarten. Next. As I mentioned, the budget announcements were for planned investments and there are a variety of different timelines for these to be implemented. And the possibility that over time, some of these will be modified, potentially reduced or increased as more specifics of state budget and federal allocations are known. That being said, we can expect some rollout to occur yet this fall with most of the rollout occurring into the winter and through to the spring. 
next. COVID-19 has had an extremely, I think I'm done for this section. I apologize, <laughs> Supervisor Chavez. I have slides for a different uh, part of the agenda. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. I'm gonna turn this over to um, Dr. Smith and um, next. And Kathleen, I see your hand up. We're gonna do questions after, unless this, did you wanna give feedback? I just wanted to check, uh, Dr. Dewan, but um, basic aid schools are not going to get the TK funding or will they? Um, we do still need to advocate for additional funding um, to schools um, who are in basic aid um, school districts to get additional funding for TK. It's not a, they are still able to provide TK and would be expected to do so, but they currently um, would not receive any additional funding because they're not funded based on enrollment and attendance like other districts. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna now turn to Dr. Smith. Thank you, uh, Supervisor. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen appropriately. Hopefully you can see that. Yes. Okay. Um, well, to start off from the standpoint of county government, the historical responsibility that we've had that we fulfilled for the care of children is focused on the safety net and has been based upon multiple programs that are developed by state and federal uh, and local entities and then implemented by the county. And I just wanted to show you all this. This is a website at our data portal. And because of new leadership on the board, we started two years ago with a children's budget that will show you as you explore what we do for kids and how we do it, split up into four categories, ways to keep children safe, ways to keep them healthy, ways to keep them learning and to keep them successful in life. And you can go through all of the detail here, but let me just pull up something to help um, see in general what we do. Um, our budget for the year 21 was about $980 million. In October, our budget projections for the year 2022 will be online, uh, which get published when our final budget is finalized. And you can see here that um, keeping children safe is definitely the largest expenditure in social services. So that has to do with um, child support, I mean, uh, foster children support, um, child protective services, all the other so social services that you can imagine. And what you can do here is click on this slide and show it by table and it'll go through all of the different programs, the expenditures, where the money's spent, how it's done, and a little description. And you can do that for the entire uh, budget. And so our board has really tasked us as staff with giving them a clear idea of where we're investing county money and services to families and children. And the children's budget is just a start in that direction. The other thing that we've been doing and we're in the process of fulfilling is the creation of a children's and families um, policy office in the county executive's office. And we're in the process of recruiting right now for a leader for that office. And the concept here is to coordinate the children and family services throughout the entire county so that we make sure that we know what we're doing, can coordinate it and stay in our own lane, not interfere with the school district or the cities, but make sure that we fill in the holes where they exist. Now you can see our expenditures for learning and successful living have historically been low. And the board has been clear that we're going to expand those and expand our interest in childcare. And the uh, COVID response was <clears throat> a good example 
of learning for us because it taught us that in the midst of a crisis, childcare becomes even more essential than it does in normal life, which is already pretty essential. So we focused during the um, <clears throat> COVID crisis upon uh, providing access to childcare for essential personnel, first in the county itself and then in surrounding organizations. And we're pretty successful with developing contracts with child care providers in order to provide those services. However, we also learned during that time period that it was critical for all of our employees to have child care um, with increased um, telecommuting and other uh, needs. Um, child care was really a determinant, an extremely important determinant of whether people could successfully uh, complete their work as well as balance their family needs. So we've been directed to negotiate with our employer groups, employee groups, a benefit now, which will include childcare as a benefit for all county employees. Um, in addition to that, um, we must continue our, our role as providing services to the underserved community. And um, we will continue that with our social services investments. And then there is uh, considerable interest on the board, uh, which I won't speak for them, but interest in developing a long-term vision of uh, available and affordable childcare for every resident in the entire county. Obviously, this will take a lot of coordination with the school districts, the Office of Education, and the cities. Um, but that's our goal. And uh, we're very well on the way to provide it. In terms of special uh, funding sources for child care, we as the county don't get any special funding sources that are dedicated to child care. Um, and that's a remnant of funding at the state and the federal level, um, which focuses on program-based uh, fundamentals. However, the board has uh, given us direction and administratively we will be bringing to the board uh, suggestions for funding for a, coming from the ARP funding to go to childcare in our community. Uh, and that will obviously happen at the board's discretion. So uh, that's pretty much all I have to say, unless you have questions. Thank you, Dr. Smith. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Council Member Adena. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to introduce somebody that probably doesn't need an introduction. He has been uh, a fixture really in the city of San Jose and a long-term employee. Um, and that's Angel Reels. He's our deputy city manager. Um, he's been leading the team uh, in working together on this issue. Um, you'll hear uh, about a youth master plan and just uh, some wonderful coordination efforts that he's been um, taking on um, under the city manager's office. Angel. All right. Well, thank you, Chair Dennis. Uh, good to see so many um, uh, champions and child advocates here. Uh, um, th that was a real impressive portal, Dr. Smith. Uh, we, we definitely need to incorporate that strategy here in our city. Um, but just uh, I just wanted to take a quick few minutes to just kind of preface some of our some of our next speakers. And, you know, the one thing that we have learned during this pandemic, right, is that children and families that were already vulnerable prior to the pandemic just have become, for the most part, even more vulnerable. And that's a real disturbing uh, just data point. Right. And and and. And, and so we feel a sense of urgency here at the city as well. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about different children and youth strategies, but really the bottom line is that we got to do better. We, we got to be more intentional about how we do this work. Um, the, you know, as I think back to the pandemic, I mean, over and above the investments that the city was already making through the pandemic, we invested an additional $3.6 million that went to subsidize direct access to childcare slots and support for children and families. But that's just you know scratching the surface, as we all know, right? Um, and and this and this concern really really was brought home to me uh, about a few weeks ago when I was uh, had the opportunity to uh, speak to 
to about 30 youth that were in our uh, San Jose Works uh, job training program. And it's their, it was with their first jobs. And one of the questions I asked them, it had to do with their hopes and fears. And one young, uh, one young uh, teen, uh, her response, I think, just nailed it. She said, you know, my biggest fear is not being able to live in the city that I've been raised in. And to me, I think that just really brings home really the, the why of this, you know, uh, meeting here, right? Um, and, and from a city standpoint, throughout this last budget process, we, we made a very intentional commitment with the support of a lot of the, uh, the elected officials that you see here in, in, this, in this committee. Um, we are intent on developing a children and youth master plan. Uh, for the city, and we hope that this Children and Youth Master Plan is integrated with our community-based partners, the county, all, all the different uh, you know, partners um, that, that are in this uh, field, and, and uh, so, that we, you know, so that we as a city you know, stop talking about what we need to do and, and codify these things in an actual plan that gets funded and invested in you know, as we move forward. So, so I'll say a little bit more at the end of the presentation, but just again, wanted to thank you and, and just let you all know that as a city, we are intent on, on really uh, you know, holding ourselves accountable and true to uh, investing in our children and families uh, going forward. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah Sarate, who uh, will give you a snapshot of, of, of the landscape uh, here at the state and federal level. Thank you, Angel. Good afternoon, council members, county supervisors, key partners, and members of the public. My name is Sarah Sarate, Director of the City Manager's Office of Administration, Policy, and Intergovernmental Relations. As our partners in the county summarized, we saw historic federal and state investments in child care and early education this year. While the city's programs weren't eligible for direct federal or state funds, Funding was directed to the ecosystem of licensed child care providers and school districts now required to provide universal TK and expanded after school programs. As we seek to leverage partnerships with local programs supporting kids and families, there are potential opportunities for San Jose to contract with school districts seeking to meet increased demand for after school programs. Another recent policy development was the expiration of the license exempt provider waiver for school hours programming. As a license exempt childcare provider, the city of San Jose can only provide a total of 14 weeks or less of public recreation programming for school aged children in a consecutive 12 month period. In addition, state statute specifies that the programs can only be offered outside of normal school hours or periods when students are normally not in session. The city was granted a temporary waiver under the COVID-19 state emergency declaration that expanded the 14 week limit and allowed the city to operate during school hours. This enabled us to run our remote learning pods during school closures. As we look towards legislative advocacy opportunities for next year, we would again pursue statewide funding for license exempt childcare programs operated by libraries and city recreation facilities. We can also explore a legislative fix to current state law, limiting operating hours and barring license exempt programs from operating during school hours. Moving legislation can be challenging and requires collective, potentially multi-year commitment from many stakeholders. And opposition and policy hurdles do exist in this space, particularly from those who hold that providers not subject to the same standards as licensed providers should not be allowed to expand their hours. Um, nevertheless, we, we are committed uh, to those efforts. And now um, that concludes my portion and I think I'm passing it off to is it Michelle? Thank you, Sarah, um, for that wonderful um, presentation and really um, uh, expressing uh, concisely what we've done last year for our families and the response that our city employees um, um, found themselves in that role to take on um, and provide safe places for our kids to be at uh, while they learned. Um, via tele, tele, 
I don't know what do you call that, tel not telehealth, it would be tele-education. Anyhow, um, so we're gonna um, move into a discussion period. And this is really an opportunity for us to um, ask, ask some of those questions that have been burning. Um, I think Kathleen had one. Um, I also have a question. We're, um, as soon as we finish with this discussion and maybe some of these brainstorming um, ideas on how to um, coordinate with all of us, we're gonna move into section uh, 2B. Um, uh, after that point, we will hear public comments. So just for those folks who are listening to our meeting from home, you'll have an opportunity uh, to comment after section 2B. This is technically just finishing up um, section 2A. So while, while I'm on, uh, um, on the queue here, I do, and because I know Dr. Bauer needs to leave by a certain period of time, I think four minutes, I'm going to just ask her really quickly. Uh, Dr. Bauer, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I know that you and I connect uh, from time to time and I hear about you know the hardest to reach communities. I'd love to hear um, if you could be that voice for some of those folks who can't make it to this meeting and express some of those needs, uh, top priorities, the convenience of location, um, and maybe some gaps that you see that you'd like to have addressed. Thank you so much and good afternoon to everybody. It's so wonderful to see a whole bunch of beautiful, familiar faces and total um, uh, champions of early learning. Uh, it takes me, you know, it's, as I heard Dr. Dewan and Dr. Smith and, and Sara, uh, Sara Te, um, you know, it just brought me, it, it took me back to my first year as a superintendent in Alum Rock, where we had a major uh, gap in terms of providing preschool for all the students in Alum Rock. That was how this kind of conversation got started in Alum Rock in a whole number of people that came to our support in those early days of early learning um, in Alam Rock. And I just wanna give a huge shout out. Uh, when I, I was looking at, a, at the, the last presentation and all of the things that the city has been able to accomplish and to move forward, it just reflects a lot of the work that we did in those early days. and be, Thanks um, to Council Member Carrasco because um, back in those days, if you remember Magdalena, San Jose Learns was a huge part in Alam Rock of how we were able to fund the gaps in terms of early learning. Um, and, and I just have to say thank you. Back then we had, we were one of the first districts in the state, us and somebody down south who started providing TK and uh, young poor uh, education to our students in that quest of providing early learning for every child in Alam Rock. And in, in that um, effort, uh, we were not receiving any, it, it, was a, it was a district contribution, the district uh, invested in that and we were not getting any ADA for those students because remember the formula was you get money until that child completes five. So we were very bold and we invested at the tune of about $4 million per year for about six years and enhanced those dollars with San Jose Learns to provide a full day kindergarten and after school programming for those students. Because these were the kids that received, that, that had access to nothing. They did not qualify for Head Start because their families earn $100 a month too much. You can imagine that. There, there, was, there was not, some of them were not able to afford state um, preschool and there was just not enough slots, no seats. So we're talking about those gaps that were and they, they currently are. Um, for Alam Roth, $4 million a year in order to put, to invest in those families was a was a considerable contribution. Not getting anything back from the state. This year we're in the two point six 
million because of declining enrollment and because a lot of those families were not able to stay and survive in our county. So that is a huge gap. The lack of affordability and providing those spaces where families can bring their students in a high quality early learning programming is the, the major gap for students in the east side of San Jose. The other major gap, it's being able to provide flexible hours to our families for this kind of care, high quality care. Because remember, a lot of our families are those first responders, um, essential workers, that we're not able to take the, the blessing and the luxury to be working from home and they needed to have immediate high quality care and be, because the, of the lack of affordability and the lack of presence of these kinds of programs. I know that the city did an amazing job trying to provide and stay preschool and all of our preschool partners around us did magic and I'm, I'm just gonna use that word, at a time when nobody had children back in, the, in classrooms, they did. So huge kudos to that, but it was just not enough. And so city, county, check that out, right? That, that, that was a huge impact to our economy countywide of people not being able to afford to live in our area because they could not have, find affordable child care, the care of children in our area and not being able to, to stay here. And now we are having a huge challenge trying to find those workers to fill our vacancies. Because I wanna see in any, in these beautiful tiles around, you know, as I look at all of you, you tell me who has not had cha a challenge hiring for your vacancies right now. And that is the, uh, as a consequence of those kinds of things that we thought they were luxury at some point. Sometimes, you know, the old traditional, you know, childcare is for those who can afford it or for those who, you know, this is something that the mom needs to stay home. That sounds very 1940s, but a lot of people still believe that. And that's why the, the lack of funding, because we have not transported education in the care of children to the 21st century. Um, and lastly, um, we also need a variety of ways of delivering this care. And that is also um, in terms of weekends, at nighttime, when people need to go and work, right? If I'm in a night shift and I'm a mom or a dad, and I don't, you know, somebody needs to take care of my little one, where are they gonna take them? And this is not only, you know, for early learning, but that also becomes an issue for elementary uh, uh, age school children. So uh, council member Arenas, you asked me to talk about the gaps, what is going on? That is a little bit of, of what is going on. And I wanna thank you so much to each and every one of you for participating, for listening to this. It, it's about time, right? And, and hopefully we can come up with those kinds of creative solutions that um, had the, 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 the initiation back in those days of the 2015 and 2016, when things like um, SJ Learns was able to say, you know, Alum Rock, uh, where is your gap and we're able to, and, and how do we partner? And so that's kind of the spirit. We need to be um, uh, solution oriented and creative and innovative to be able to provide for this huge gap that we have. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm going to excuse myself because I have 22 teachers of the year that I need to go and celebrate. So thank you so so much, guys, each and every one of you. Kathleen, Dr. Dewan, so glad to see you. Uh, um, Supervisor Ellenberg and Cindy, great to see you. Veronica, I can go on and on. 
but I'm excited. I'm excited. This Dr. Bauer, please congratulate them on our behalf. This whole room is uh, beaming with pride here. I can tell. Thank you for thank you for your comments. I'm going to move to um, the panelists um, and uh, Supervisor Ellenberg. Thanks. Do you mind before we start the second panel, if I just make some some quick comments on the first and suggestions that we might all be thinking about as we hear the second panel? Absolutely. But I right, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciated hearing what Dr. Bauer had to say. Um, she hit hit a lot of the critical issues. And what I would really posit for everybody on this on this screen as a baseline is that we are all committed to the health and well-being of children and particularly the the support and care for the very youngest children in our county. So with that as a given, what we are looking at, what has changed right now is this incredible funding opportunity. So we have an opportunity before us to make long-term systemic changes. We, we could make investments that would be short-term stimulus, which is exciting, but, but I'm hoping that we can really look at a new journey together. Uh, Dr. Dewan, I thought, did, of course, an excellent job laying out, uh, and partners in the first panel, the funding. What I think is, is another critical piece, and that perhaps the second panelist will be addressing, is what funds go to what entities, because that's going to be critical in determining our roles. But from what I heard in the first part and from the homework uh, that I did um, learning about the second panel uh, before it happened is that if we go into this thinking about perhaps four lanes, we can get to a strategic place where all of us here have a role, we're moving toward this unified whole, but we know that we need to work with our funding streams and the and the essentially the, the, the purview that each of us have. So as, a, as an initial thought for everybody to listen to as we're going through, we hear a lot about workforce. If the ultimate goal, as um, Dr. Dewan showed in her, her bucket, is more seats uh, for kids, for sure. In order to provide those seats, we need to expand our workforce. And I see here, that we have an opportunity for First Five to lead, for the county to support through Bridge to Recovery to really create a lot of new good jobs. We talked about uh, briefly, I think Dr. Dewan talked about facilities. That's a brilliant place I think for the County Office of Education to lead, of course in partnership again with the county, with school districts. Dr. Smith, I did hear you say on the record that we are gonna to get to providing childcare for every single kid in this county that needs it. So we should be thinking about all of our county facilities and where we can embed childcare, not just for our own, our own employees, but for people coming into it. That's the second piece, workforce development first, uh, facilities second. A third is looking at those, those funding gaps that Dr. Bauer mentioned. What isn't state or federal government going to fund? How do we make sure that the most vulnerable kids are served well in our county? And then the, the fourth place I see for cities and, and schools to partner, um, Angel talked about the after school programs and this phenomenal opportunity that we have now with schools being required to provide those additional three hours. How do we, how do we have the cities and the schools work together on expanding those programs? So kind of pre-gaming, what I'm hoping comes out at the end of this is whether it's this vision or a different one, I'm you know, always happy for things to be better, but that we all understand that by taking different pieces of this, working on it, having specific goals and outcomes, and then coming back together to share what we're doing, how we're moving and where we need support, we can really be very, very action driven. And that is my personal hope for today. So I wanted to share it and put it on all of your minds as well. Thanks for that time. Thank you. I'm gonna. I'm looking to my co-chair, and um, I think what we want to do is dive into this next panel. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And I and let me just say, uh, folks, if you're attending, we're, what we'll do is we're going to hear this next panel, then go to the public comment, and then come back to the group for discussion. And I know um, uh, Councilmember Adenas, I, I know our, our kickoff speaker here is Dr. Dewan. Are you ready to launch that in that direction? I I I, I don't see the uh, our chair. Oh, okay. She may well, have then been cut off. Yeah. She okay. fell off somewhere. Okay, so I think, oh, that's probably why she told me Cindy move. Okay, and asked that I take, oh, I didn't read the second part of that, that text. All right, so we're gonna rock and roll. We're gonna start with Dr. Juwan. I'm gonna remind everybody that they, um, if they uh, can stay to their time, that would be great because we're gonna, we have a hard stop at 4.30 and I wanna make sure there's enough time for us to put our to-do list together, all right? All right, so we'll start to, with Dr. Juwan. Great, thank you so much. Um, I have some additional slides for this section, um, if those could come up. Um, for this section, I wanted to share a little bit more about uh, capacity and demand and look at um, addressing learning loss and some recommendations. So during um, COVID-19, there was an extremely damaging impact on early care and education in our county, as you can see from the statistics on this slide. Um, the good news of this, however, is that there are new state subsidized slots that will increase demand for child care providers, and this would be primarily uh, the licensed uh, child care providers. And we're going to uh, see um, that we need 570 to 2,000 new child care providers in order to offer the new available 8,000 uh, subsidized slots in Santa Clara County. So uh, really important that we could add 8,000 new slots to our county, um, but we will also need the workforce to make that a reality. And additionally, um, we're gonna need um, additional TK teachers uh, and teacher assistants um, in order to fully take advantage of these new state resources. Next slide. Um, additionally, um, we mentioned learning loss earlier, and there've been some reference to before, after school and summer care. And there are funds available for expanded learning, um, including the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, a new program of the state. This is ongoing funding that's gonna be provided to school districts. Um, it is only available, however, to school districts that serve TK through grade six. It um, favors school districts that serve unduplicated students. So the most vulnerable students in our county and they're only um, required to serve um, students that are in that, that category. Um, the bad news of this story is that the amounts vary quite significantly and some school districts will receive very little or no funding and some will receive uh, more funding. The formula is, um, uh, allows for more funds in those districts where there's a much higher number of unduplicated students. And using this funding, schools will be required to expand their school day to allow for nine or more hours of both instruction and child care as well as enrichment. And they have to follow the state standards for after school education and safety. Next slide. So thinking about all of these priorities, we wanted to share a comparison of the Santa Clara priorities compared to the state investments. Um, it's on the next slide. And this would show, for example, in our county, um, the boxes that are in solid colors. So the expanded learning, um, the grants for facilities, the new slots, and grants for workforce um, are promising, but they will still need significant local investment, collaboration, and partnership in order for them to meet the promise and the TK um, preschool, full day preschool slots, um, the state has made big investments. I think it's really hard for all of us to really soak in what that means for our county. Um, and what this will also mean is that smaller local investments will be needed in order for us to take full advantage uh, of those two programs. And then on the uh, blue side, the 3.8 billion children and youth behavioral health initiative statewide um, will still require some investments, including local partnerships with 
philanthropy, managed healthcare plans, and others. But all of these come together to show what's available for child well-being. Next slide. Um, so a few areas of recommendation, um, uh, kind of going back to what Supervisor Ellenberg mentioned, in the area of workforce, the county office is eligible to apply for grants to train, um, but those grants were, are going to require local matches. Um, there are some recommendations here for facilities. For example, there are funds, these will all be competitive, but they will also require a local match, uh, local investment in order to be eligible for the funds. And in terms of services, um, students have been requesting some specific materials and activities. This would be a way to maximize that nine plus hours of the day uh, mentioned on earlier slides. And the availability of additional slots, these 8,000 plus slots and more, is going to require um, the need to increase access and do the match between the, those needing childcare and those providing it. And lastly, um, there are some programs that the county and the city of San Jose um, could be eligible for certain state vouchers and coordinating this through the uh, one countywide referral network um, would also be a possibility. So these are three areas that are well positioned for partnership and that would allow our county to take full advantage of these competitive funding uh, opportunities before us. Thank you. Great. I'd like to um, next introduce um, Wendy Mahani Garuhu, uh, Chief Impact Officer with uh, First Life Santa Clara County. Um, always Wendy, a and Wendy needs to be elevated to a panelist. She just oh, okay. It. Tony, did you hear that? Yes. Wonderful. So while she gets on board, maybe what we could do is just um, move on in, and have Angel uh, Rios introduce uh, the rest of the, the presentation that's going to come from the city of San Jose. And then we can go back. Uh, I did make it in. Here you go, Wendy. Awesome. Perfect timing. So good. Thank you, Council Member Reynas and uh, Supervisor Ellenberg. I got kicked off my computer and now on my phone. So here we go. <laughs> Thank you for having me. If we could pull up our slide deck, that would be great. I think it's next. So first I wanna thank everyone, not only for inviting First Five to participate, but also for having the foresight for a joint session on child well-being. You have gathered some of the great partners to share with you here today. Just to note, we've included a memo describing the Quality Workforce Development Initiative with an eye for equity that we'll be discussing today. Next slide. All of our work during the pandemic has been in community and with many of the partners here today. We uh, began our journey together with the city and the county, putting together essential emergency child care for first responders, responders like the healthcare field and the fire and police in the city. And this was really successful, so successful that when the state started expanding what essential workers, who they were, we were able to open up more childcare and support them as well. We also worked with you all to create a stabilization and scholarship fund as we tried to support these small micro business family child care home providers with $10,000 awards that help them keep their doors open and pay for past due bills. We also had annual scholarship program, um, certainly that was supporting families who were critically in need at this particular time. And finally, we worked on procuring critical supplies to distribute to childcare providers as they did not have access to these goods and materials. We all know about the run on uh, paper towels and toilet paper and cleaning supplies. Our partnerships were able to access them and distribute them as well. Please move the um, next slide. The, chal the challenge has been, sorry, we can go back a slide. The challenge has been really to identify the per permanent solutions to support our childcare infrastructure, looking at equity. 
the work on sustainability to support early learning and ca the care early learning care field often falls in three areas and much of it was discussed earlier however to point them out um, distinctly they are access to child care affordable child care and quality child care with an emphasis on workforce development these are big big areas when working with a mixed service delivery system uh, let's see, today we will be focusing, the next slide, sorry, one more. Each of those, by the way, need their own strand. Um, yeah, our slides are backwards. I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> they're getting, they're coming up backwards. But can we go there? Keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going. There we go. We'll just leave it right there. One more. Go into the middle. What? Not the house. Go back up. Yeah, they were put in backwards. Okay. Today, we're going to be focusing on the third area of child care infrastructure, workforce development, equity-focused initiatives. It was just reported by the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment that we have lost nationwide 127,700 child care jobs since February 2020. In our own county, of the approximately 2,000 child care operators, 260 of them have been permanently shuttered. It's devastating. 60% of our folks who are in an operating or teaching in early learning access social service supports. It's a, certainly understood that these folks are um, not paid at the wages that are necessary to not access those support. And as our small micro business family child care homes 40% of our, our women, first of all, all of most of them are women, 40% of them self-identify as Black, Indigenous, and people of color. This is why we're focusing on creating three workforce development initiatives to support not only our field, but also the larger economy. The first is the Shared Service Alliance that will create a Santa Clara County Family Child Care Home Network with a focus on supporting family child care home providers with back-end business supports that they do not have access to. They, much like they're needing support accessing medical care or doing their taxes or tuition, um, creating tuition schedules, this is a, often report to, reported to us as a deep need as well as prof a pro professional development structural support system. The second area that we're focusing on is supporting the universal transitional kindergarten process uh, programs as we work closely with the County Office of Ed in supporting interested early care and education professionals in obtaining their teacher credential so that they can access the higher paid jobs where, where they have benefits and union protection. We also want to support the efforts to advocate for an equity oriented emergency credentialing process. And finally, we are working on creating an apprenticeship program, much like the one we have in the trades. We already have a staffing crisis currently in our county with some of our, and now with some of our professionals moving to universal transitional kindergarten positions, we're going to need to backfill. We are working on this particular program and it has been replicated in other counties throughout the state. We'll be working with many partners like community colleges, workforce development boards, county and city, um, you all folks, the County Office of Education, child care uh, center agencies. And our intention is to build and bring new highly skilled educators into the field with the end result of being placed in higher paying jobs. This is where we work on things like bridge to recovery or where we're identifying folks coming out of CalWORKs and giving them other opportunities for well-paid, paid, highly skilled jobs. In closing, we believe that with the partners, all of us together in the field and the funding with an eye towards an equity lens, workforce development initiatives will become the sustainable infrastructure for our early care and education professionals, thus supporting our thriving economy. Thank you. And again, we are happy to answer questions and partner in any way possible. Thank you, Wendy. And um, I also got kicked out, probably nobody noticed, but <laughs> This is this is the era that we're living in. Uh, you did such a wonderful job, and thank you for those graphics. It really shows us where families are. We're going to move on to uh, Angel Rios, and 
having him present on behalf of the city of San Jose along with uh, the rest of our presenters. Um, so I'm just gonna hand it over uh, to, to Angel. Thank you, Council Member. Um, we'll, we'll go, we'll turn this right over to Michelle Ornott with our San Jose Public Library and Hal Spangenberg from Parks Recreation Neighborhood Services. Thank you, Angel. I'm Michelle Ornott, Deputy Director of Public Services for San Jose Public Library. Next slide, please. I wanted to share briefly today about city policy and two areas that the library is supporting early care workforce development and early learning. In May 2018, the City Council unanimously approved the Education and Digital Literacy Strategy with San Jose Public Library as the lead department. And this direction is to devise and implement a comprehensive educational policy and work plan for early education, learning by grade level proficiency, and pathways to post-academic success. Foundational to these three areas is digital literacy, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and policy and governance. Each area is examined with respect to essential factors, including analysis using local data to identify needs, to evaluate potential solutions, and to assess outcomes. The coordination and integration of systems and partnerships are prioritized to improve access to and increase quality of educational programs provided by the library, parks, recreation, and neighborhood services department, and other city funded program providers through alignment with quality standards. Next slide. San Jose Public Library is committed to supporting early education workforce development in the city. This is a snapshot of current programs being offered, the reach in the community, core focus areas, and the outputs each program produces, including quality childcare spaces. Of particular highlight, is the Family, Friend, and Neighborhood Caregiver Support Network. With the support of the San Jose Public Library Foundation and First Five Santa Clara County, the program was launched in January 2021. The objective of the FFN Caregiver Support Network pathway is to increase the training and education levels of the license-exempt child care workforce in San Jose. Successful completion of these programs in the current iteration by our participants can yield more than 900 additional childcare spaces. The second program, the FCCH program, will follow closely with that FFN pathway. And two additional support paths are available through Career Online High School and also through our SJPL Works programs. Next slide. In support of the city's education policy and EDL strategy, SJPL provides several preschool learning foundational programs designed to meet the needs of children ages zero to five and their caregivers, particularly through story times and kinder readiness. In fiscal year 2021, the library utilized the early education quality standards assessment tool to assess virtual story time and virtual kindergarten readiness programming based on the pivot that we had to do and also based on eight program quality standard areas resulting in an achievement of an overall rating of proficient quality, which leads directly back to the priorities that we set forth with the education digital literacy strategy. Now I'll turn it over to Hal Spangenberg. Next slide, please. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, good afternoon, council, committee members, community partners, and members of the public. Uh, my name is Hal Spangenberg, and I'm the interim division manager for PRNS, and I've also served as the assistant director of the EOC childcare branch for the city of San Jose for the past year and a half. This slide represents childcare related programming that PRNS has provided and plans to provide throughout the fiscal year of 2021 2022. Included in the summer programming are full day camps for youth ages five through 12, and our half day preschool camp for youth ages three to five. These camps serve nearly 1,400 youth throughout the city of San Jose at 22 locations and provided over 20,000 lunches and snacks. Our school year programs, which began in August and run through June, include a variety of after school programs, San Jose Recreation Preschool, and teen centers, serving youth from preschool age through the 12th grade. We currently have a total of 56 programs operating, serving over 1,200 youth. Due to the utilization of PRNS scholarship funds and CDGB funding, we had distributed over $1.8 million in scholarship funding to support these programs 
and greatly reduce the barrier of cost for families in need. Next slide, please. Because of the reporting and tracking requirements for utilization of CDGB funds, Darren has had the ability to track usage data that we haven't in the past. This slide represents a snapshot of subsidy utilization during the summer of 2021. 81% of families that have received a subsidy through CDGB fall under the category of extremely low income threshold, which ranges from an annual income level between 34,800 for a household of one up to 65,650 for a household of eight. While this is useful data to collect and use to shape further budget decisions, it is also important to note that state funding sources for childcare and expanded learning use different income thresholds than federal, federal CDGB. Additional data analysis is necessary to understand populations and income data corresponding to subsidy levels and any eligibility gaps that may exist. Lastly, through the use of a variety of funding sources like CDGB and COVID relief funds, Karen S has had the ability to triple the amount of subsidies available, resulting in families most in need to enroll in these programs at no cost. We know that in order to continue this past this fiscal year, funding will need to be identified as this is not a sustainable method since these funds are tied to COVID relief and are not ongoing. Next slide, please. PRNS was selected to participate in the City Innovate Stir Lab Challenge in the spring of 2021. During the six month period, PRNS partnered with the University of North Carolina at Greensboro to lead and conduct a needs assessment to inform recommendations to improve childcare policy, funding investments, and programming and infrastructure for our most vulnerable populations, focusing on pre-K through sixth grade, and specifically the San Jose Recreation Preschool and Rock After School programs that PRNS offers. The keys and goals of this project were to engage staff, elected officials, community stakeholders, and families to better understand the city's roles and approach in addressing future childcare related policies and investments and ensuring positive outcomes for all and those most vulnerable, regardless of race, gender, age, or income. BRNS and UNCG led focus groups, which resulted in a total of 174 participants sharing their unique experiences and perspectives surrounding childcare opportunities within the city of San Jose. The study identified numerous barriers for families to access childcare, such as limited childcare resources, childcare costs, hours of operation, and geographic barriers, and also identified possible solutions to close these gaps, such as an increase in community partnerships, investments in facility improvements, investments in staff and staff training, increased financial support for families, and increased programming support for youth, such as academic and social emotional support coming out of the pandemic and related to learning loss and social isolation. The study concluded that overall, the city of San Jose has had a long-standing commitment to promoting the well-being of its citizens. And this is especially true within the city child care programs. The program's dedicated staff, commitment to cultural competence, and efforts to support vulnerable children brings value to the families they serve as well to the broader community. The needs assessment described in this report identified several possible changes the city could make to further strengthen these programs. Information gleaned from existing data reports, in addition to the new information gathered through the project, focus groups, and interviews, underscore the need for the city and its partners to continue exploring approaches to promote equity with respect to meeting families' child care needs, as well as to promote children's school readiness. The findings also support the need for creative solutions that expand the city's role in address, addressing child care needs in the community and supporting other child care providers in San Jose. By centering the goal of promoting equity and reducing disparities regarding child care and relatedly children's school readiness and academic performance, the city of San Jose can continue to build a community that is supportive of its most vulnerable families. Now we'll turn it over to Angel Rios. Next slide. So, and so, so with those barriers and gaps in mind, you know, we here at the city, you know, see opportunities in three primary areas, just for starters. Uh, the first being in the area of policy and data alignment across agencies. Um, you know, th through this last budget process, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we did get direction to develop a, a children and youth master plan. And it's a, a master plan that we intend to also apply an equity lens to, uh, to ensure that we're addressing uh, those most vulnerable in our community. Um, we also have an opportunity to really advance and, and, uh, and implement an education policy that we 
that we previously got approved. And that whole education policy is important uh, because what it does is it really drives quality standards, uh, it, both in recreation programming as well as library. Basically, any city programs that touches the life of a young person would be subject to the, the, these quality standards that would be applied to. So I think it's really important driving quality. And then, of course, in the, in the area of, of child care is really taking a look at city assets, uh, wherever applicable to, to really uh, explore and fund the conversion of those assets into child care slots and uh, recreation programming facilities. The second area of opportunity we see is in the area of expanding access to early care um, and, and really looking at increasing the number of both licensed and license exempt uh, slots and availability. Uh, we're also looking at um, assuming we were successful and in, 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 uh, with some public policy advocacy, you know, really looking at adding full-time preschool at all city facilities to the extent possible and, and or wherever applicable. Uh, and, and the third one, which is really making sure that we're not working uh, just in, in, in a vacuum, we're just working by ourselves, but that we integrate what we're doing with all the various partners so that we're part of a larger, broader ecosystem. I think we need to do better in this area and be more intentional around how we braid what we do with, with all the other services that serve uh, our children and youth. Uh, and then the third area is really in the area of expanding access to city after school programs. Um, you know, in some cases with respect to Parks and Rec, for example, we have a cost recovery model. So we need to really revisit that and, and, and find creative ways to, to basically increase the accessibility by either eliminating, um, you know, those cost recovery, uh, you, know, you know, approaches that can sometimes be uh, prohibitive, especially for, uh, for, for poor and working families. Uh, as well as increasing programs, uh, after school programs such as ROC and including in there, in those programs, an academic uh, a component that would also, again, further advance uh, uh, children in academic development. Um, and then of course, um, just working to, to really tap into other funding streams above and beyond general fund to make sure that we're maximizing the investment in young people. So those are the kind of like the three areas that we've identified so far. It's not an all-inclusive list, um, but I think it's a start. And so we just wanted to throw that out there. And so uh, with that in mind, uh, I think we'll, we'll just turn it over. I believe we have an employee. I know during the pandemic, uh, you know, we did work uh, in coordination with the county as well to make sure that we're providing uh, access to uh, free childcare uh, for, for, uh, for employees, especially those that were responding to the pandemic. And I believe we have Kendra Yarn who uh, is here to give a, just a very quick testimonial on how that went for her. So Kendra, I'll turn it over to you. Hi Kendra. Hi Angel, thank you. Hi, my name is Kendra Yarn and I am a Parks and Rec employee and I've pretty much been here for quite a number of years. And half of that time I've been a mom. But during the pandemic, our programs um, really allowed me to focus on supporting a lot of things that we had going on within the community. And without that care and that opportunity, I would have been a complete scatterbrain. There's no way that I could have supported my department in the way that I did without the programs that we have and that we offer to the community, which I have fully taken advantage of the entire time that my kids have been age um, able to participate based on age. So I've had my kids participate in the Hero Camp program, which we set up for the first responders that were supporting pandemic. They've participated in our, in our San Jose Recreation Preschool programs um, when they were preschool age. And each year, um, each summer, um, I have them in our summer camps. Um, transitioning from distance learning into our summer camps, I saw a huge difference in their behavior at home, um, which actually made everybody's home life a lot different. But once they were back in a safe social setting, um, they were so excited to come home and share with me what they had done throughout the day. They shared the arts and craft activities that they were so proud of accomplishing and making throughout that day. All the different new games that they had played, you know, after sitting in front of a computer for their safety, right, during the distance learning time, but just being active and socializing again with other kids. And then also just the connections that they were making with staff members, other adults outside of our household, right? Creating that trust, thinking of the community, um, it's been awesome to be able to have my children participate in that, which has in turn allowed me to be able to focus on my work and the support that I provide to the department. I can seriously go on and on and on. And if there was one thing that I actually wish we could do for the school year was allow my kids to participate in our rock programs after school. Um, so when Angel talks about 
access or expanding our rock recreation programs, I think whenever we're able to provide another opportunity for families, especially families that need to work, um, to provide the multiple um, service providers at each site is kind of a good thing because then those family members or those families are able to think about what, you know, what's going to work best for their family. Do they want to be able to have their child in an ACES program that goes until six o'clock or do they want to have the flexibility of a paid program and pick them up and spend, you know, a, a pick them up earlier than that six o'clock time frame. So I love our programs. They super help me and they help my kids. Um, and if there's any other questions, I think I was only supposed to talk for two minutes, so I'll try to keep it at that end of report. Kendra, that was a beautiful testimony. <laughs> um, I love it. I love it because these are the voices of our parents and our working moms that we are um, hoping to address today and that we will be addressing together. Um, so uh, before I turn it over to uh, Supervisor Chavez, I just wanted to thank Angel once again for his leadership and um, Hal Spangenberg, I think somebody, uh, I, I didn't say it was a miracle, but I sure as heck will take that uh, compliment up. I know that when we had our learning pods, you were absolutely crucial in, in that effort, Hal, your um, heart is always in the right place for our children, and that is your North Star, and I really admire that. Um, and as well as uh, John Cicerelli and uh, Jill Bourne, um, on, on her side of the library, there's a lot of really great ideas that came, uh, informal care that came uh, through that, as well as Anne Grabowski um, and Michelle Arnott. And so I just want to, you know, these are just some of the folks that you see here, but behind them, there's a, a huge force of people that have a desire and a passion to serve our community in a way that fits them. And so when I heard about uh, uh, Dr. Brower talking about non-traditional hours, I think that's something that maybe we, we should take up in the discussion part of this. Um, but I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, we're gonna turn now to uh, Marissa, who's a county employee, and then we're gonna have a couple more speakers before we go to the public. And I just wanted to alert the public that if you would like to speak, um, your turn will be coming up after the next few speakers. So this would be the time to raise your hands. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marissa, who's a county employee who wanted to give some reflections on child care and her needs. Hi, um, my name is Marissa and I work for the Department of Family Children Services. Um, I want to share um, just some needs that I had in the past in regards to child care and then other feedback that I've had from um, coworkers and even the families of DFCS that we serve. Um, and in regards to that, um, like my daughter, she, I have a 12 year old and I have a 14 year old. Um, my 14 year old is autistic. So it's very hard to find childcare for her, not only because of, you know, the certain challenges that she has, but every time there is um, a program that opens up, it is like completely ambushed and jam packed within, you know, hours or the day or two days. Um, and so there, you know, I've noticed that there is a lot of childcare programs out there, but there's not enough and they fill up extremely fast or they become unaffordable. Um, you know, the other thing I wanted to say was uh, working with DFCS, I've, you know, the two most biggest problems that, you know, people come to us, families come to us about is uh, childcare and housing um, and childcare, you know, it, I'm sure you all know it's very hard to go to work and and focus and do what you have to do when you don't have you know somewhere to put your child or your child gets out at two o'clock and there's not a, there's an after school program but it's completely full so then you have to work with you know your boss who if you know hopefully they work with you to get out sooner to the programs are full and whatnot um, so I mean. I just from my experience, I've been, you know, and I've been lucky enough to have, you know, my mom, a lot of family, and I work graveyard. So I'm able to care for my kids. But that's not something that's realistic for everyone, you know, out there or working for the county, that they can work graveyard and be able to pick up their kids and, and uh, drop them off and whatnot. Um, so I just kind of wanted to share that and in hopes that, um, you know, 
you guys hear me and, and hopefully there's some programs that we can expand out there or even some affordable programs. I've been lucky enough to uh, take advantage of the city of San Jose community center summer camps um, where, you know, I'm able to, uh, because my daughters get reduced lunch, I'm able to apply for a financial scholarship. Um, but again, that's something that you have to apply three to four months in advance and it's gone within uh, less than a week. Um, and then after that, it's just extremely expensive to put them in, in uh, summer camp. Um, so, I mean, if, you know, there can be some programs that are offered some more, um, it's definitely beneficial for our children out there. We want to make sure that we, you know, have enough programs and supportive positive programs so that they grow up in a positive environment and we prevent them from going the wrong direction in life. Thank you very Thank much, you. Marissa. Appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Is Norma with us? I don't see Norma. Uh, soy yo, soy Leticia. Ah, okay, perfect. Buenas tardes. Buenas oh. tardes. Mi nombre es Norma Pamaz y soy madre soltera y líder de Somos Mayfair. Uh, desde que mi niño tenía un año, he estado tratando de ponerlo en un programa de cuidado de niños para yo poder trabajar ya que dependo solamente de lo que me da mi expareja. Desafortunadamente, en todos los lugares que he tratado de aplicar, no he podido calificar. Uh, ya que me piden algunos documentos uh, que yo no puedo proveer. Uh, y que es, y pues no estoy trabajando, lo cual no he podido no he podido hacerlo porque no tengo el cuidado infantil en las mañanas y no puedo trabajar en las tardes ya que incluso uh, los programas después de escuela siempre están llenos y hay lista de espera esto me hace imposible el que pueda salir adelante con mis hijos y por eso estoy el día de hoy aquí esperando que mi testimonio pueda ayudar a traer y a fortalecer los recursos que Tenemos en nuestra comunidad, al igual que facilitar el proceso de documentación como madre soltera, que para mí es una prioridad, prioridad el poder recibir estos recursos y que mis hijos tengan acceso a programas de calidad y equidad mientras yo pueda trabajar y proveer lo necesario para mis hijos. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Norma. Thank you, Norma. Um, we have two more uh, presenters under this section, and I just wanted to do a time check, a reminder that um, that I understand uh, Councilmember Arenas will be calling on our public speakers, and we're going to um, go to hear two more public, I mean, two more presenters. We'll go to public comment and then back to the board. This meeting was supposed to end at 4.30. We're, we, I know uh, both Supervisor Ellenberg and I have a hard stop at about 4.45. Um, so I wanted to make sure, and also for our panelists, I know many of you were, were planning on a 4.30 meeting as well. So we're gonna see if we can all hang out uh, just a little bit longer to make sure we can get to the, the next steps. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Veronica Goey and then to Catherine King. And Veronica Goey is the Executive Director of Grail Family Services. Welcome. Thank you, um, Supervisor. Uh, if someone could pull up my uh, slides, please. Really appreciate it. Um, good afternoon, Supervisors and Council members, um, members of the committees, uh, partner agencies, and members of the public. Uh, my name is Veronica Go. I'm the Executive Director of Grail Family Services, and I'm also here uh, on behalf of the CISA Poetic Collective. Um, I very much appreciate your invitation to share the voice of the East San Jose community. Um, next. In making funding recommendations for ECE services in East San Jose, we believe it's important to consider community assets as much as the identified needs. As part of, as part of our ECE assets, GFS and the CISA for the Collective serves 
hundreds of uh, young children through a variety of ECE service delivery models highlighted on the slide. Some, some state funded preschools, parent co-ops, a network of licensed childcare providers. And most recently, Grail Family Services in partnership with the collective was selected um, for a national economic mobility initiative um, in which we are training 24 unlicensed providers in our community, uh, which is uh, incredibly excited. We're very excited about that. These service deliveries, all, all these approaches were designed to meet the needs and the preferences of the families we serve. The programs all include a strong parent engagement component, which we view as critical part of the service delivery. Many of the parents have become strong advocates for young children. Next. Our families have identified a variety of needs. However, offering childcare during um, alternative hours has risen to the very top. Many of our parents are essential workers and don't have a nine to five job. These workers are critical for the city's and county's economic recovery. And then uh, I know that we are pressed by time, so I'm gonna uh, finish with a couple of recommendations. These recommendations are actually, next slide please. This recommendation are actually coming from the community. Um, our community would like to see some of the resources spent in purchasing and use facilities for closed childcare centers due to the pandemic and or increase the capacity of existing facilities to meet the high need for childcare in East San Jose. Uh, to activate existing childcare facilities during alternative hours, and to implement policy and the use of a tool that will help assess the need of childcare in all new housing development projects during the planning phase. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. And now we'll turn over to Kathleen King from the Healthier Kids Foundation. Yes, as the last speaker, I'm gonna say, I don't need my slides. I'll just put in a couple of sentences. Uh, everyone knows what I'll say already, which is health and support of small children go hand in hand. And I just can't imagine when we send kids off to kindergarten who may need glasses and don't even know they need them or they're going with a toothache. So I just want to remind everyone that when we're talking about early education, early support, we're also talking health. And I'm so excited when I see organizations working together to leverage their, res their uh, resources. I also will say, I can't believe San Jose's recreational department is cost recovery. I would be uh, impressed if you checked out some of the other cities and utilize what they do maybe to help you decide how you handle that going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kathleen. And I'm gonna turn it back over to our, our co-chair, my co-chair, Ms. Arena. Thank you. We are going to uh, go to our public comments and I will, at this point, I think, uh, Count, uh, Supervisor Chavez, are you in agreement for the two minute uh, span? We have, we have um, how many, we have nine speakers? Nine speakers. Okay, that will, I think that'll give be about 20 minutes and then that'll give us 15 minutes for next steps. So if we can do that, that would be fine. Great. Um, we could also, we can reduce it down if we find ourselves losing um, key panelists here. Okay, so let me go to um, the person with the phone number ending in 5140. Go ahead. Yeah, this is great. I'm glad the taxpayer is going to be footing the bill for all this. It's ridiculous what you guys are proposing. What's going to happen when the money comes out? There's not enough money to provide everybody everything. And then all of a sudden you want the county and city workers to be subsidized too? They're already getting paid fat salaries. It's like glorified welfare for you people. You don't understand it. You're not going to have enough money to, to do all this. And you never, ever think about the taxpayer nor do you thank the taxpayer ever, 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 ever. It's just more, more, more from the taxpayer. It's disgusting. And I'm tired of having to hear the womb to tomb that everybody needs 
uh, everything from the taxpayer. When do you, when do you people think the money is going to run out? You know it's going to happen. There's no way you're going to be able to sustain all this. It sounds so feel good and everything. It is not. You people are going to bankrupt this county, this city, the state, and the federal government. It's already happening. Hey, by the way, why don't you, your buddy Joe Biden, how's he doing? How's he working out for you? How's that guy working out for you? Look at what he's doing. Is he going to help you out now? I doubt it. He already has you guys hooked. Thank you. Um, Mr. Paul uh, Soto, go ahead. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, first of all, I'd like to speak about the translation. La Senora did not say, look at his Cape Town, South Africa. She did not say that. Yet that's what came out on the translation. Cape Town, South Africa is the heart of apartheid. I'm sure everybody here is educated, so you know what apartheid meant. Please check it. Second of all, in 1968, Sophie Mendoza marched on Roosevelt Junior High School, marched the kids out of there. Why? Because of the abuse, the dehumanization, and the degradation, and the shameful acts of San Jose Unified School District and Elm Rock School District. What they were doing was they, my mother slapped her. They took her to the front of the class and beat her. Why? because she was Mexican and she spoke Spanish in the school districts. I do. I can be in a room with 100 Mexicans that speak Spanish. I cannot communicate with them. Why? Because my mother was so shamed that when, she, when we were being raised, she thought that we would be beaten too. So Spanish was forbidden. Thus, I'm cut off from a complete cultural connection with my own people in San Jose. And it started in the school districts. I'm tired of Mexicans being disrespected. I'm tired of Mexicans being exploited for their work. They run this city. Let the, let the Mexicans strike for a week. This city shut down. When shut, we need to start having some more respect and some priority of our translations. Don't you ever put that translation I want a human being Translating English, considering, especially meeting, considering experience and what I continue to experience every single day, my lack of ability to speak Spanish, I think I got that coming. Thank you, Mr. Soto. Next is uh, Mr. Peter Ortiz, uh, Trustee Ortiz. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello, honorable members of the City Council and County Board of Supervisors. This is Peter Ortiz, Vice President of the Santa Clara County Board of Education. Uh, as the chair of the Office of Education's Joint Legislative Advisory Committee, we have worked to elevate advocacy for the expansion of early childhood education and, and care as one of our main priorities. Um, a major barrier uh, that exists on the local level to child care expansion is the lack of suitable facilities, which was outlined in many of the reports. The Office of Education remains eligible and willing to apply for competitive grants for facility expansions, which will require a local match of funding. Um, I want to thank the body for their great work in support of child care providers and expanding access to child care. I want to also uh, ask you that you please continue to build upon direct resources to programs that serve the needs of children experiencing poverty. Too many parents cannot return to work simply because they cannot find subsidized childcare. So they're forced to stay home or rely on dangerously informal care for their kids. You know, we also see this uh, as a problem for working families and the need for after school care. Uh, when the insufficient amount of subsidized after school options result in children being home alone without safe supervision. Um, I, I thank the city and county for their ongoing support for early childhood education and child care, and also urge the agencies here today to invest in child care facilities, as well as scholarships and subsidies for both child care and after school programs. Thank you all for your hard work. Claudia Rossi. So sorry about that. I was going to speak without uh, unmuting myself. Yes. 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 Hi, can you hear me? 
Yes, uh, Trustee Rossi, we can hear you. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Good afternoon. I'm Claudia Rossi, President of the Santa Clara County Board of Education. I'm also a registered nurse, uh, proud to work in South County. I want to thank Supervisor Ellenberg, who has led the Joint Child Care Committee and championed the children's agenda, as I strongly believe these will provide a firm foundation as we jointly advocate for solutions to the pandemic faced by the working poor. I'm referring to the child care crisis. In addition to investments in child care workforce, I believe our children need and deserve safe and welcoming spaces that serve the whole child. Children not only need safe spaces, but spaces to run, play, socialize, relate to one another under the safe care of adults that nurture the whole child. As school sites are occupied 180 instructional days with only some sites used for summer school offerings, I believe we can examine funding sources to convert school sites to child care centers when school is not in session. The expanded definition of infrastructure under the Biden administration and the collective expertise and passion in far reaching networks of leaders like you can truly create transformational change for our children, working families, and women of color who make up the majority of childcare workforce. Thank you all. Thank you. Next is uh, Sandy Walker. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks to all of you. I really appreciate the leadership you're providing in this critical area. The Y uh, delivery system for childcare after school and summer camp will benefit greatly from workforce development and additional financial assistance. But I'm here today to tell you that I'm very encouraged by the opportunity that I see here. You know, as the CEO of the YMCA here in Silicon Valley, I believe that several of you mentioned an ecosystem and a cross-sectional approach to the solution. And I'm very encouraged by that. You know, I hope that we're building an asset map of where the capacity exists. And we're thinking not only in the county and city resources, but to community service organizations like ours. And if we can map out where there's capacity to build and where we can develop workforce uh, pathways for parents and others, I think we'll have a greater impact on what we're trying to accomplish together. Uh, I'm also uh, encouraging you to think more about off hour care and off hour workforce development opportunities for parents to see how they can build their own career path by considering being caregivers. And finally, this capacity building will require all of us to work together. And I believe a cross sector approach is just what's needed. So thanks for all that you're doing. And please know that the YMCA and other agencies like ours are very uh, strongly interested in being part of building capacity and being part of this important solution. Thanks. Thank you, Sandy. We will take you up on that. Next is Don Taylor. Good afternoon, I'm Don Taylor, the Executive Director at Epla Family Services. Thank you to the council members, supervisors, presenters, and staff. And I wanna recognize the importance of what you've shared with the information and collaboration today. The importance of this, we've seen already paying dividends in our own experience through integrated care, behavioral health and substance use needs that we've been able to partner with at schools via the SCCOE, the city of San Jose, uh, direct to district work, our behavioral health services through the county and, and via health plans. And this has led to expanding support to over 12 districts and 125 schools. We know that the coordination with organizations like First Five, the Mayor's Gang Task Force, School Health Clinics, Healthy Kids Foundation, Pivotal, Kids in Common, to name a few, are really what can help impact the full student experience. And while there remains much to improve on, we see the dial continuing to move in a positive direction. And I see this happening through the listening, partnering and recognizing the whole student need. And I thank you all very much for your commitment during this time and happy to be a partner in this. Thank you. Thank you. And next is Val Villaverde from Aki. 
Good afternoon, members of the Board of Supervisors and City, San Jose City Council. Uh, my name is Juan Villaverde, Director of Advocacy at Asian Americans for Community Involvement, and I'm here to support efforts to improve services for children, especially those living in underserved communities. Uh, here at Aki, we firmly believe that early access to educational, preventive, and wellness services is key to ensuring the future health and success of our children, and we strongly support recommendations to expand programs providing flexible child care and early childhood education, along with recommendations to dedicate funds to integrate tutoring and emotional, uh, social emotional service um, to, into programs for children. We also agree that developing a master plan for children and youth in San Jose would be a great step in ensuring that the city is able to meet the long-term needs of underserved families. Uh, we thank the, both the Board of Supervisors and the San Jose City Council for your commitment to meeting the needs of children, and Aki looks forward to working with our city and county partners to continue this work. Thank you so much. Amber Mopress. Amber? Amber Mopress. Okay, I'm gonna move on to caller 5724. Caller 5724, press star six. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, um, my name is Gabriel Hernandez, uh, the director with the uh, she supported collective five organizations here on the east side. Um, someone described it as four lanes. I describe it as a four-legged table. Um, the investment in workforce, um, like Veronica on your panel had spoke to, we are in the process of training uh, child care providers, and um, we do have some gaps in that funding. And so, yes, look at the organizations that are working to develop your child care providers the workforce, the businesses, and the jobs that they would provide. Um, and again, if we're gonna talk about the equity lens, let's talk about the COVID equity lens um, and the impact that it's had on, on the communities in the East Side and Gilroy. Uh, facilities, there's a number of uh, facilities that are vacant um, that have gone closed. Um, they're already licensed and, and vetted. Buy those up and uh, rent them out to us. We'll take them for a dollar a year and after 25 years, we'll uh, negotiate a lease to own so that after 25 years, we uh, can own those properties. Um, the gaps in funding uh, for the most vulnerable, again, if you talk about the description of, and the definition of homeless, um, homeless is single mothers uh, with children. And so we have to look at figuring out ways of doing that. We're working with um, um, Destination Home and other organizations create guaranteed income uh, for those families. And so take a look at the one-time monies that you have from the, the uh, rescue funds to, to fund those types of things so that we can provide the income that a lot of these families have lost as, um, as providers um, for their families um, to shore that up. And then finally, the schools, cities, you know, whether it's ARUSD, Tara Sri Krishnan. Hello, uh, this is Tara Sri Krishnan. Uh, I serve as a liaison to the Strong Start Coalition on our County Board of Education and just want to echo uh, comments from our Vice President Ortiz and President Rossi, who spoke earlier and thank everyone here and on the panel for hosting and prioritizing this discussion for uh, long range efforts to sustain childcare providers and to support their need for workforce development. And on uh, the Strong Start Coalition advocates for the expansion of early care, health and education for children birth to age eight and coalition members believe that local investments are necessary in order to have a comprehensive system of early care and education in our county. And local investments could include enhancing existing programs to be full day, full year with co-investments from the city and the county. 
um, also advancing equity by investing in training and workforce development for centers and family child care home personnel, um, increasing local investments to supplement state funding to secure more subsidized care spaces, um, use of one-time funds to stabilize existing providers to prevent closures, um, and as uh, Vice President Ortiz mentioned earlier, um, building out facilities. So again, thank you for prioritizing this discussion. Veronica? Great, thank you. And I also wanna thank all the panel members and everyone for um, really prioritizing this. Um, but also as we prioritize this, we need to also prioritize housing as many of our families are losing housing, right? They're losing where to live. And just providing childcare does not solve the problem of our families living here. Rents are up $3,000. People, uh, we saw it, right? We saw it during the COVID um, pandemic where multiple families live under one household. Um, and if that stress comes before that, then families are not going to be looking for childcare before they start looking for housing. Housing is a priority. And so I think as we are thinking about funding for childcare, we also need to think about how can we find housing for families as well, and not just build affordable housing, but actually have them become homeowners, actually having that pathway for them to earn, for them to be able to have equity to give to their children later on, because that's something that we're missing in this county. Um, I also want to uh, talk about the importance of, uh, as we're working on our workforce, having them train for special education. Um, I have, my, ch my child has special education, and he went through the county program, preschool program. Um, and, you know, it was so hard educating the teachers about his um, different needs and supports that he needed throughout. Um, and thankfully, I had really amazing teachers that got with it and were very interested to learn more. But we need to make sure that they're being taught that or that we are providing those kind of trainings consistently as things are changing fast. Um, and many of our students that need and learn different than others. So, again, and I also want to ask you all to put this meeting in the afternoon 2 30 it's really hard for parents to attend especially those that work so having another session in the afternoon would be great thank you don perry and thank you and before we begin uh public comment tony i believe uh um if we don't reduce our minutes to one we will be losing our our co-chair here um so let's reduce those uh comments to a minute Okay, give us just a second to reset the timer to a minute, and then Don Perry will be next. Go ahead, Don. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to witness the continued commitment that the county and the city of San Jose has to children and families. It's really wonderful to see that continued. And a quick hello to Dana, Veronica, and Angel, who I won't say are my old colleagues, but my senior colleagues. Just a couple of things. Um, as you work forward, please look backwards at programs such as Smart Start San Jose that were very successful, but lost funding during the Great Recession, and maybe bring back some of those aspects. And secondly, look to some of our cities like San Francisco that has a facilities fund for um, childcare facilities that they get through development and developers. So just some things to look at that you're not starting from the beginning, but you are truly moving forward for children and families. So again, hi to my past colleagues. I hope you're doing well and take care. Thank you. Robert Reese. I wanna thank everybody for their good work on the childcare. Uh, issues and the policy development on the part of the city and the county. I chair the land use committee of the District 8 Community Roundtable, and for a number of years we've engaged, been engaged in a conversation with the San Jose Evergreen Community College District about the necessity for them to serve more district residents. One of the things we found out in an engagement session we had with them is that their child care facility had been closed for a number of years prior to the pandemic. There's a very robust 
a child care program serving students at San Jose Community College, but not at Evergreen Community College. There's a couple of distinct opportunities for policymakers and community makers to impact um, policy in this regard at Evergreen Valley College. President Gilkerson is going to be having an educational master plan development process occurring soon. And there's also going to be an east side resolution that looks at more services for East San Jose. Thank you. Laura. Hi, my name is Laura Rechka. Is that who you're calling? Yes. Hi. And I'm from the Welch community. And I just want to thank the city and the county for your collaboration on the children's issues. I just wanted to comment that as a mother of two grown sons, no longer need child care. It's great to see that these opportunities and funding is being available, hopefully, to our communities. Because way back then, when I was a working mother, they weren't. And today in this community, there is a need for more scholarships to enhance and guide the future of our children. And in addition, I just wanted to comment that I've had um, our community also come up with um, interest in special needs children that, you know, they need scholarships also and also focus on them. So I just wanted to speak up for those children too. Thank you. Stephanie Allen. Stephanie. Hello, my name is Stephanie Allen and I am representing the African American Community Service Agency. Um, some things that we just wanted to highlight. Um, one, uh, we support funding opportunities that activate early care and education spaces during evenings and the weekends. We all know that here in this county, especially um, families, um, whether single parents or having both parents in the home, they do rely on having multiple forms of income. So providing a space where um, we have daycares that are open later in the evening um, would definitely benefit many of the black and brown um, families in our community. Also, um, we support funding opportunities to expand the physical existing early care and education facilities especially those of color, um, to increase the capacity to serve families. Thank you. LaVera Foster. Hi, my name is LaVera Foster, and I represent the African American Community Service Agency, and I support funding opportunities that represent underserved communities in our county. Please keep these populations in mind as any decisions are made. Thank you. The final speaker is Janet Holt. Thank you very much. I'm uh, District 8, and I'm on a couple of different neighborhood associations. And I would like to thank the committee and Sylvia Arenas for her work with uh, child care and education and children and women. I think that you folks should promote to us ordinary citizens the wins that you've done. I had the fortunate uh, opportunity to speak with Patrick McGarity a few months ago about some of the awesome things that happened in terms of education for some of the underserved children in our area who would not have had the opportunity to continue their education had some of these programs not stepped in and helped them out. Please promote these things so that we all can help you and celebrate with you and be happy to give you our, our money and go out and promote it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the last um, speaker is Rocio Abundis. Uh, she is a panelist, but she also wanted um, uh, a moment to speak. Thank you. Um, so Rocio Bendis, I am the manager for the Prevention Bureau in uh, the Department of Family and Children's Services, and I'm also a Child Abuse and Prevention Council member, uh, vice chair for programs. I am thrilled to hear this conversation today, and I'm very excited. Um, one of our prim primary thrusts in the Prevention Bureau is to pre prevent child abuse and neglect in overrepresented communities, specifically uh, Latino and Black communities. 
um, child abuse and neglect is not um, a DFCS issue alone. It has to be across systems. So I'm thrilled to see all of the partners that are here. It's also not a single issue problem. It's a very complex. There's a lot of things that contribute to it. And I wanted to mention that we just recently hosted a series of prevention summits and we ended it with a list of recommendations that came from community. And those recommendations include housing, domestic violence, economic support, equity access to resources, behavioral health, parent education, and to no surprise, childcare. All those issues are intertwined and we can only do this together as a collaborative. I'm, I'm making my own commitment to sharing with you the recommendations that came out specific to childcare. We would love to see those recommendations. And yeah, we are um, really out of time, but uh, not out of energy and uh, areas of discussion to talk. Um, I know that there's a lot of panelists who have lots to share with us. And unfortunately, um, we're going to end our meeting. And before we end it, um, we're, we're going to hear a motion on each side of the committee. I would like to encourage everyone to join us for part two. There has to be a part two of this um, discussion. And so in the part two, what we'll do, and uh, as my co-chair, Supervisor Chavez, if you agree to this, maybe what we could do is summarize some of these gaps that uh, have been um, uh, reiterated through the meeting um, and public comment, um, as well as, um, as well as some of the opportunities um, in a form of a like a memo or letter. Um, I think that you had suggested that to me earlier. And so it, it's a great idea. I'd love for us to do that and then uh, continue our discussion from that point on. Um, and hopefully we, we can get this meeting um, soon enough so we don't lose any momentum. Does that work? Yes, absolutely. Perfect. So I'm going to um, begin with uh, with um, my yeah. motion. <laughs> Janet, you're not on mute. There you go. <laughs> I'm going to begin with my motion to recommend to the city manager, manager to utilize phase two American Rescue Plan funds, as well as other funds that become available to expand rock programs, as well as integrating tutoring and social emotional service strategies and partnerships, additionally develop a sustainability plan for the expansion of rock. Um, I heard some great comments um, throughout this meeting about uh, th that particular need and capacity. Um, second uh, part of that is recommend collaborate, recommend to the city manager collaborating with Santa Clara County Office of Ed and Santa Clara County on efforts to utilize federal and state funding to create additional scholarships and alternative payment program availability for children and families. And, uh, and potentially, I think we, I heard earlier, maybe advocating together for regulatory uh, changes. Um, and I think uh, I'm getting a request to um, also add in that recommendation, the first recommendation um, to integrate tutoring, social and emotional service strategies, um, health and partnerships. And so absolutely honor that we, we have to have our, our children healthy. Um, create, uh, this is the third uh, part of my motion, create an immediate child and youth action plan drawing on the committee um, direction today, uh, and particularly the potential opportunities that we heard, as well as developing a long range child and youth master plan um, and report on the progress to NSC committee. Lastly, to agendize the second meeting of the NSC committee and committee of the whole, um, and the I'll leave the, the part for CS, CSFC to do their part, but hopefully they'll agree to bring a, a forward updated information on the funding opportunities, as well as system improvements and a coordinated approach, including reporting on collaboration between uh, SCOE, Santa Clara County, the city and partner agencies to explore a regional coordinated system for funding and wraparound services for children and youth uh, beyond age six. And so, that is my motion. I'll second that. Wonderful. Hey, Council member, can I just offer one minor edit? Uh, to, Absolutely. To first Please. part, and that's to add the word explore in front of utilize. So recommend to the city manager to explore the utilization of American Rescue Plan 
because that is a process, but we definitely uh, are interested and willing to explore uh, the use of those funds. And um, and I think the language incorporated in any other funds as well, right? Isn't that yeah. what uh, yeah. Council Member Arena said? Yeah. So yep. uh, I'll, I'll 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 accept your your edit, and I'll second. Thank you. And uh, Supervisor Chavez, do you have a motion that you'd like to? I'm gonna. I'll let you vote on yours, and then that way we don't. Oh, there we go. Uh, I don't, yeah. Can you? Uh, Although I'll vote on yours if you'd like. I would love for you to make it uh, past the finish line here. Um, Tony, would you call roll? Menes. Yes. Cohen. Esparza. Yes. Carrasco. Aye. Arenas. Yes. And thank lastly, you. I'd just like to thank uh, Council Member Esparza, Carrasco, of course, uh, Council Member Jimenez, um, and all the folks who make this happen. Karen, who is our, who keeps us legal uh, and in line. Um, and of course, uh, uh, other folks who've just joined us as panelists. We didn't hear from you, but we'd love to um, have you continue to join this conversation so that we can get that wonderful feedback um, because you have your ear to the ground in terms of families and what they need. And so thank you, Dana Bunnett, for, for also being here. Um, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, make a, a similar motion. Um, first, I'm going to ask that we agendize for a, an upcoming meeting of Children's Family Seniors Committee to discuss um, this meeting in the framework that um, Supervisor Ellenberg put forward relative to workforce facilities, funding gaps, and after-school programming. Second, that um, we ask for staff a clear funding map and asset map relative to child care. Um, third, that we um, offer any support we can to the city of San Jose in their children and youth master plan so that we can look for opportunities for overlap and collaboration. Um, next, that we invite a representative from the city of San Jose to be on the hiring panel for the children and family advocacy position. I think that might be good in terms of, um, you know, uh, ensuring collaboration. Um, and finally, that we ask staff to begin the policy work or a policy framework for consideration by the Children's Family Seniors Committee to include an evaluation in all new construction, all new purchases or buildings where there's significant tenant improvements that the county owns to evaluate them for the availability and use of child care. And that would be my motion. Supervisor Chavez, just have one clarifying uh, question. I, I'm very happy to support the motion. The direction that you gave on a funding and asset map, I just wanna make sure it's what I'm thinking it, it is as well. We talked about the funding streams today, but not where they go. Are you asking to hear which of those funds go to city, county, libraries, schools? Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, a very hearty second to that. all of that, thank you. Thank you, and all of this information would obviously be shared with our partners in the city of San Jose. And we would look forward um, to working with um, uh, Chair Arenas on a follow-up meeting. In particular, we'll wanna work with staff so that we know there are some concrete pillars that we're gonna be able to check in with. Um, and, I, and the only other thing I wanna add is that there is some, there are some speed issues relative to this because of funding that's available from the state and funding that will be available from the federal government and uh, that would be my motion I, with all of that understanding. And Supervisor Elmberg, that's still okay as a second? Absolutely. Okay, well, this is a rowdy vote. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> Roll call us. Person Ellenberg? Yes. And Chairperson Chavez? Yes. And thank I will you. offer, thank you so much, Dave. I'm going to offer the universal thank you all to the city of San Jose, to all the council members and the staff, and everybody who made today's meeting possible, and also to the to the county. I um, just really appreciated Dr. Smith, you spending uh, so much time with us today. I know that means a great deal to me and to others. And um, Dr. Duan, really happy that we got a chance to see you instead of the courts in, in uh, jury duty. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Chavez. I'd also like to thank your staff 
Amy Nguyen and Maja, uh, who have just been wonderful, and as well as my team, Mariela Garcia. Um, we have Patrick McGarity and Nancy Lay. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, we look forward to working with you and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks, all. Thank you so much.